Hi everyone, thanks for coming today. My name is Ellie Rennie. I'm um, a researcher from the Swinburne Institute for Social Research and it's my pleasure to be chairing this session today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present, as well as those from other clans who now reside on Wurundjeri land. So the new news uh, conference by the Centre for Advancing Journalism is presented in partnership with the Wheeler Centre and supported by Swinburne University of Technology. This session is also supported by Melbourne Social Equity Institute. So today's session is on Indigenous journalism. And Indigenous media is, of course, a really important part of Australia's media landscape. And we've got a very elaborate Indigenous media system in this country. In terms of television, we've got NITV, which is now on SBS. We've got the Indigenous Community Television. We've got a couple of narrowcasters, including Galari TV and Larrakia. And, of course, Impaja, um, the Indigenous-owned commercial television satellite um, TV service. Uh, and those, those broadcasters, of course, uh, come from across the community broadcasting sector, public service media and commercial. In terms of radio, we've got a number of Indigenous radio news networks and um, other networks. In terms of news, we, we see Indigenous news coming out of both the National Indigenous Radio Service and, of course, Karma Radio, the first Aboriginal radio station based in Alice Springs. And the ABC has also recently commenced Indigenous news broadcasts um, in Walpuri and Yolngumata. So uh, they're broadcasting two news bulletins a day in those languages now. Of course, in terms of the uh, print media, which we'll be talking a bit about today, uh, there's the Koori Mail and Land Rights News, until recently also Tracker Magazine. <laughs> um, and we've got, of course, Indigenous journalists working across a range of different mainstream and independent media. But what's going on in the new media landscape? I was interested recently to see some figures by McNair Ingenuity Research that showed that eight out of 10 Indigenous Australians are using Facebook compared to only six out of 10 um, Australians nationwide. So there's obviously some opportunities for getting uh, news out to Indigenous people through new media channels. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. We're going to talk about where Indi Indigenous media innovation lies, where it's coming from, and how Indigenous news can best impact on the national news agenda. So I'm just going to quickly introduce the speakers, then I'll give them each a chance to have their say. Um, we'll get into some questions amongst the panel and then I'll open it up to you guys towards the end today. So uh, our first speaker today is going to be Jim Remedio, who's this recently become the station manager of 3KND, uh, Melbourne's Indigenous radio station. Jim's a key innovator in Indigenous media, uh, particularly broadcast media. He, he ran Karma Radio for a number of years uh, as well as um, the Queensland Remote Aboriginal Media Association. And he's played a huge role in Indigenous media advocacy and policy throughout his career. Kelly Briggs will be our next speaker. And she writes about First Australian issues. Uh, she has a blog in conjunction with Crokey. And um, she's going to speak today a little bit about um, the Indigenous blogosphere and crowdfunding of Indigenous media. Um, our next speaker after that will be Patricia Carvelis. So she's the Victorian editor and bureau chief of The Australian, and she writes regularly on Indigenous affairs. And then we'll be hearing from Amy McGuire, who is currently a journalist with New Matilda. Before that, um, she was editor at Tracker Magazine, as well as the National Indigenous Times, and she's on the board of the Australian Indigenous Communications Association. So, um, over to you, Jim. Thanks, uh, Ali, and uh, good morning, everybody. And, of course, I acknowledge the uh, Wurundjeri people as well. Uh, I know them quite well down this way. 
Uh, I'm here today to talk about developments in uh, Indigenous media, and I just want to give a small snapshot, I guess, of, uh, of, of, of where we've come from and, and, and where we are today. Um, indigenous media, I guess, it's best to look at it as moments in time uh, when development of an Indigenous media was rapid and dreams were big. Um, the fact that dreams were so big and we were so excited meant that we overlooked some of the realities. Um, the key one was that with very scant resources, as those you here today from community media understand, is that we always tried to spin straw into gold. And uh, as we know, that's uh, you know, quite hard to do in our media. It really started with the, uh, Indigenous media really started with the birth of community radio. Uh, and, and the power we felt at the time uh, when our people began to speak uh, and be heard uh, was, was something real. Um, you know, the, like the importance of having a voice in the language we still use today across all media, and you'll hear terms like um, our voices, the voice of our people, our community, uh, deadly sounds, deadly voice, cool and deadly. Um, anyone who has worked in Aboriginal media knows this language and it really came from the opportunity that we saw in radio and the sp spoken word, like talking to our mob. Um, this was a powerful uh, tool and it still is. It generated huge desire to set up our own radio services and we set up a lot of them. Uh, we believe that we can spin the limited uh, funding into grand media empires, and some of us did, and we talked it up and we took on too many things. We thought that uh, with this funding for radio, which wasn't really enough, we'd keep doing more and more. But as more and more services come online, the same bucket got shared between more and more. And then some of us thought, let's do TV with the same money as well. And some of us did. And then let's do multimedia. So we get to the, to the, to the situation where we're getting to uh, today. Uh, the bucket diminished in real terms and every year over the 20 years. And some of us spent that 20 years making the case for it to be properly funded in line with the obligations of the, the government under the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Through their peak body, Indigenous media organisations developed a roadmap for our future and its foundation was a robust radio network across the country. From there we planned our own autonomous broadcasting service and to expand into different platforms at our own schedule. We wanted to build a roadmap, then we wanted to build it the, the way that the community controlled media organisations wanted to do that. And then finally in the mid 2000s through the Telstra sale dividend, as people may remember how it's uh, sell at Telstra, we we're about to get our first substantial funding, I think it was around about $44 million. However, at the very last minute, 40 million was, was diverted into creating NITV. And radio was left with only 4 million for a basic upgrade for some remote services only. I don't want to go back into the past, but I mention this to show that the creation of NITV was not the choice or plan for Indigenous media sector. It was a government decision, and that's why the early stages of its establishment were so turbulent and met with some opposition from many Indigenous media organisations. And that turbulence led to the government deciding that Aboriginal people couldn't manage it themselves and they decided to give it to SBS. And so it went out of Aboriginal community control. And at that point, the big dreams about Indigenous control media really stopped for a while. But We've had experience of this in our, in our history. We've had experience of a lot of things, Indigenous people. But we always get up. And of course, there was a new things happening. And, and we now have to take into account the vast changes going on in all media, just like everyone else. I noticed uh, Malcolm Turnbull's advice to the ABC to stop suggesting that they have to cut programs and to restructure, reform and modernise their networks. This is what some of us have been doing with no funding and a bit of ingenuity. For the last three years I've been working in Cairns revitalising an old uh, remote area 
uh, Aboriginal radio network known as Remo. It services 16 services across Cape York, Gulf of Carpentaria and Western Queensland. It's now called the Black Star Network. We've completed uh, changes, that we completely changed the technology of delivery using a unique wide area broadband network that allows a combination of hub and local management. We've adopted new and effective marketing and training. The result is that for the first time since those services were set up in the 1980s, they are on air now 24 hours a day. If there's a cyclone coming, people know and get their regular updates tailored for them. They get news, weather, on the hour, seven days a week. These things might seem basic to you, but until Black Star, people in those areas were indeed living in a silent land. In conclusion, you might wonder, seeing you are here to talk about new media, why I'm still going on about radio. Radio is a foundation service. It's free, you can get it in the car, you don't have to be on a plan or have an expensive phone. It provides a huge amount of the content that feeds other new media. Everyone else who has access to different forms of new media already has a radio. From the story I've told you today, that didn't happen for Aboriginal people. Other people don't have to choose. Now I'm working here in Melbourne, 3KND, cool and deadly, and uh, we're looking to use the same technology as was used up in, in the Cape York area to provide that service to Aboriginal people across Victoria. 50% of Aboriginal people in Victoria live outside Melbourne, and it's the fastest growing Aboriginal population in the country, and they have never had their own radio service. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Jim. I do absolutely want to return to that question of whether we've got the mix right. Uh, whether we have too many services or the right kinds of services. But uh, first of all, I'll, I'll pass on to Kelly. Uh, yeah, my name's Kelly Briggs. Um, I'm a Gamilaroi woman from New South Wales. I, um, I acknowledge a Wurundjeri as a traditional owners of the land. And it's a privilege to be here today. As a, is it for Mental Health Day? So it I'm is. Not sure. Uh, it is. It is, yeah. Yeah, no. And um, so it's a privilege to be here today as someone who lives with uh, mental health issues. It really is. Can you speak um, up just a little bit, Kelly? Sorry. Put it closer? Just a little bit louder. Yeah. Yep. Great. Um, I've written a lot about um, leaving work and having nothing to do. And I found Celeste Liddell's Black Feminist Rant blog, which really inspired me to do my own blog. And then after that, I found Twitter, which was weird and um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I started to write my own blog and um, because I've written all my life I, I write all the time um, and it got some attention I got a lot of attention at one point and then it kind of tapered off which is cool um, I currently blog for um, Croaky blog um, Croaky health blog I blog on Indigenous health issues from an Indigenous health consumer's perspective I do use Indigenous health services a lot. Um, I blog under the name The Courier Woman. It's a very basic, no frills um, WordPress account. And I always say to anyone who's black, you know, if you're black, you got a computer, you got an internet connection, you know, make a blog, you just start talking, and people start talking back, and that's the way it goes. And um, it's a really good way for me to vent my frustrations about various things in between writing job applications, if anyone. Is it hiring? Um, um, it's also opened a door where uh, people ask me regularly to write stuff for them. Uh, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Uh, it depends on who you ask. Um, I also administer a rotational Twitter account called Indigenous X. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, it's a weekly rotational Twitter account that is hosted by a different Aboriginal person each week. And it's, if you follow that Twitter account, it's, it's really, it's great just to see what everyone's talking about, what just everyday Aboriginal people are talking about. You know, you know, and you may be surprised because they talk about a lot of different things and we're not all the same. We're not just all one big homogenous group. We have a different views on a lot of different things. Um, um, oh, Later on today, um, at about 2.30, I'll be talking about crowdfunding, which I crowdfunded the Crokey Health blog, The Seven Pieces. About 2.30, I'll be talking about that in a different session. So if you want to come, please come. Um, 
Oh, and initially I was feeling really, really intimidated to be sitting on this panel with these people, especially Jim and Amy. Um, I felt the same way about you. Yeah, no, because, mm. and was like, because I was like, oh, God, Patricia, what? Um, I'm a, a big fan of Amy's. I, the stuff she wrote on the, on the Bowerville murders was, was, I thought, just something that just blew me away. It was award-worthy, I thought. And um, Jim, of course, I think I met before in Canberra with Tiger Bales. And um, obviously Patricia. You're behind a paywall. I can't see your stuff. <laughs> Sorry, but someone's got to pay my wages. Yeah, well, I should do that. Yeah. Um, but um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful to be here today. And I was intimidated, but then I thought, you know what? Why should I be? Because I am an Indigenous person. And I write about Indigenous subjects, and I write about it from an Indigenous perspective. So, you know, and I can write what I want to write when I want to write it. What more freedom can somebody want? So... Um, just in conclusion, I'm happy to be here and, um, yeah, follow my blog and, and please follow me on Twitter. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Patricia. Thank you. It's funny you say that. I felt the same way because I'm the, um, other than you, I think, um, only non-Indigenous person on this panel. Sorry. Um, and, but I write a lot about Aboriginal affairs, so I'm always aware of that as being kind of weird, it's like men writing about sort of, you know, feminist issues every day. There are, it's kind of, there are issues you've got to think about when you do it, but, uh, you know, I reckon it's, someone's got to write about Aboriginal affairs in the mainstream media, so I'm happy to do it because I like to do it. So, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on Wurundjeri land, which is where I live. I'm from Melbourne, born and bred in Melbourne, lived in many other places in Australia, but back here now and liking it. I do follow Indigenous X every and enjoy watching the different uh, awesome. tweeters every week, um, you know, and some are more engaging than others and it's, Definitely. you know, yeah. yeah. Some tweet a lot, some you th don't hear from them all mm -hmm. week. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's uh, absolutely, that's part, part of what I'm going to address today. So thanks for inviting me to report on and talk on this panel. Writing about Indigenous affairs is a passion of mine, but it's also my job. Um, I wanted to say I, want to I often find it deeply frustrating to watch Indigenous issues being covered in a cycle of crisis reporting. Every couple of years a story emerges that captivates mainstream media attention and is followed by all outlets, cross the board, blanket coverage. But what happens in between is that coverage ceases or becomes sidelined. At The Australian we cover Indigenous affairs every day and not just occasionally. From the top down the paper ensures that Indigenous issues are front and centre of the national debate. Indigenous affairs are not placed at the back of our news pages, they're on the front page and that's where we believe these issues need to be and I still think whatever your critiques may be, it's the only newspaper that will consistently put Aboriginal affairs on the front page. The revolution in social media and Twitter has indeed had a strong impact on giving people, particularly marginalised people, access to a new platform to share their views and lived experiences. In the past, this individual publishing was not possible so it provides many avenues for Indigenous people to have a say that they would not have had in the past, and I think that is undeniably a very good thing. I follow many, many Indigenous people, including Aboriginal people representing large Aboriginal organisations and even small ones, um, and they use Twitter to express their own individual view about policies, but also put out the, the views that their organisations have, and I find that a really crucial tool in my journalism now. But there is no doubt social media has given people opportunities to express themselves without being censored or controlled or having their opinions filtered, which inevitably happens in news gathering. It, it's, you know, a fact. You make choices about who's quoted, you make choices about who's at the top of the story, that's part of the process. I think a legitimate part of the process, but that's why this social media provides an amazing opportunity for people to say, I don't want to be filtered, I'm just going to put out what I think. And if you gain enough followers, people are going to listen. Uh, contact between reporters and real people who are at the coalface has the potential to, I think, improve reporting and increase the diversity of voices. And I can tell you that I've used Twitter and social media to pick up stories myself. I follow prominent and not so prominent Indigenous people. Many have tweeted about things that I later contact them about and include in my stories. 
To give you an example, in the past, someone like Kirsty Parker, who represents the National Congress, the peak Aboriginal uh, representative organisation now, would have gone through a media officer to express views. Um, now we operate on two levels, the old way, the media officer press release way still exists, but also I'll follow her on Twitter and she'll sometimes say something and I'll contact her and make it a story. Which means obviously people who don't follow her or aren't on those platforms have the opportunity to hear about it. But while educated and empowered Indigenous people have this opportunity and voice, which they do, I'm sorry to report that I don't think this is reflective of many remote Indigenous people who are not using Twitter the way we might all use it, or the way I'm using it at least. My strong view is that the actual people on the ground often don't have a voice, especially in the remote areas, because they don't have smartphones, they're not signed up to Twitter, um, and why would they be? I think Twitter is a, quite a nasty space often and I've seen many um, Aboriginal people vilified on Twitter and it shocks me uh, from the right and the left. I mean, I've seen the sort of things people have said to Warren Mundine sh actually genuinely shock me. I know they don't agree with his politics, but quite racial abuse, <laughs> uh, which, you know, I find staggering. Uh, but there are a lot, as you mentioned, a lot of Facebook users and other... Facebook is very dominant in those communities, extremely. Um, I have Facebook friends, for instance, that I have made by going on trips to remote communities who, you know, befriend me on Facebook and then I have, for the rest of time, updates on things that are going on in their communities and they do talk about things that are going on in their communities. I hear, you know, you know things about water quality and, um, you know, so, sort of experiences, lived experiences of often really bad circumstances. Because we're known as being a paper that will pursue Indigenous issues, I do receive many emails every month from Indigenous organisations alerting me to issues. A good example is the Indigenous controlled health organisations that were very active in campaigning to keep their funding in the lead up to the May budget and used me, used me as a platform to express um, their campaign and the needs and the surveys and the evidence they had for why they needed to keep um, those health organisations running and run by Indigenous people. Many organisations also have web pages which I regularly visit which also provide crucial updates on the work that they are doing. Uh, but at the end of the day, I've got to say, direct communication um, is the way that we pursue stories. Uh, contacts with Indigenous people and organisation conversations. That's the way I still do my work. Uh, but it's also incumbent on good reporters, and we have many in the field, at least from my newspaper, Natasha Robinson, Amos in the Northern Territory, Nicholas Rothwell, Jamie Walker, Paige Taylor, among others, who make sure that they keep these good contacts in the communities, which is the way you will find out what's happening. Uh, we have a number of reporters that cover Indigenous affairs. I cover Indigenous affairs, uh, absolutely. I do it very much on a national political policy perspective. I don't pretend to have day-to-day -day -day updates on what's going on in the communities around Australia. That's not uh, my chief job on the paper, but people do do that on the paper. Um, that's not me, though. Reporters like Michael McKenna in Queensland and Paige Taylor in Perth, they've doggedly pursued the story, of, for instance, to give you an example of the young woman, Miss Dew, who's become the latest Indigenous person to die in the custody of West Australian police, and they did not get that story off Twitter. They got that story because they're connected with Indigenous people in Western Australia and believed it was crucial to shine a light on that injustice. Rick Morton, for instance, also at my paper, pursued the story of Roseanne Fulton, who at 24 represents one of the worst cases of systemic Aboriginal abuse in modern Australian history, trapped in the West Australian jail despite being mentally unfit to plead for minor crimes. Miss Fulton was born brain damaged with fetal alcohol syndrome in 1989 in Alice Springs where she drifted in and out of an abusive home, was traded for sex from the age of five and eventually placed under adult guardianship at the age of 19. This is a story we covered extensively. It was not motivated by social media, but by consistent and dogged reporting. At The Australian, we do have strong connection with the remote communities, um, which I don't think are really well represented in the mainstream part of social media. Cape York, the APY lands, Arnhem Land, we're in constant contact with the leaders and the grassroots community members in those communities. Uh, all of our sections regularly feature Indigenous voices and stories from our reporting team telling the stories of Indigenous Australia. In his speech at my newspaper's 50th anniversary celebration, Cape York Indigenous leader Noel Pearson credited my paper with opening up the pages of The Australian to all shades of debate and Indigenous leaders and commentators. 
He pointed out Rosemary Neal's courageous coverage of the tragic violence against Aboriginal women and Paul Tui's searing stories of the petrol sniffing in the centre. So we've welcomed pa uh, writers like Charlie Perkins, Marsha Langton, Galaroy Unipingu, Patrick Dodson, Loicha O'Donoghue, Warren Mundine and many others who've been regular protagonists in the national conversation and have been given a platform, I think, in the mainstream to express those views. And how are those voices so prominent? It's through direct dialogue with journalists like me. My paper believes that Indigenous leaders must be able to have a platform to express their views in their own voices. I have relationship with, relationships with Indigenous leaders throughout the country and will continue to do so. So returning to the theme of this talk, because I've obviously talked about how I, as a mainstream media journalist, try to pursue stories, is the social new media platform useful in getting the good Indigenous stories out there? Or is it just good old-fashioned journalism and traditional newspaper practices that are getting the stories out? My view is that the old approach is still the best approach and is still responsible for breaking the big and significant stories and putting them squarely in the middle of the national debate and making governments, big corporates, notice. But any reporter who ignored the emerging voices in social media would not be doing their job, and I try to do both. So I think that both elements are crucial parts now of the pie, and increasingly we will see more Indigenous people uh, using those platforms to tell the stories from their, in their own voices about their own communities and about the injustices and even all the positives, because there are many positive stories in Aboriginal Australia. It's not all doom and gloom. So thanks. Thanks, Patricia. Lots for us to come back to there. Uh, Amy, any response to that or your own thoughts generally? Um, yes, obviously I have a lot of um, thoughts regarding that. Um, I am, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land as well and acknowledge my elders past and present. Um, I'm a big believer in the power of Aboriginal media and I believe that it should work as an advocacy press. Um, I actually don't believe that it should be objective or unbiased because I actually believe that newspapers like The Australian aren't actually objective or, un or unbiased in their own right. They run a specific agenda and often it's completely different to the agenda that Aboriginal communities around the country want. A key example of that is the current debate around constitutional reform. I haven't actually met an Aboriginal person who isn't actually being paid or somehow associated with recognise, actually support that movement. There's a great deal of almost discomfort around it. A lot of um, people don't actually trust government to deliver on what we actually want. And often the conversation between mainstream media and Aboriginal communities on the ground is completely different. And that's part of the reason why the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council decided to start my former paper, Tracker Magazine, because we weren't talking about land rights, we weren't talking about treaty, we weren't talking about sovereignty, but that's what blackfellas in communities always have as the aspiration, as the shining light. And that's just not reflected in mainstream media. And I think a lot of the time there is really good reporting in mainstream media, for example, the reporting around Palm, um, the death in custody of Malrangi Dumaji, which was led by the Australian, was so incredibly important. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't have... And there was never a good result in the end, but we wouldn't have got as far as we got without the Australian's reporting. But often, it works to the detriment of Aboriginal people, and that can be shown in the anti-intervention, um, which was a key example of media-driven Indigenous policymaking, which was completely, completely demonised and dispossessed Aboriginal people in the Territory, and people are still feeling it now. And I often think if we had a properly well-resourced, independent Aboriginal media sector, maybe they wouldn't have gotten away with the lies that they did. Um, a big part of the, the reason that the intervention was able to come into place with you know, which was basically without Aboriginal consultation was the fact ABC Late Line was able to get away with horrendous lies about the community of Murdujulu. I've sat in a room with Bob Randall and with his daughter who still cry because they never got an apology from ABC Late Line. They were just completely, completely... And there was a report into it that showed the community were deeply hurting. They protested when Mulbroff went with signs that said Late Line lies and Lightline still hasn't fessed up to the fact that they deeply hurt that community. And that hurt is far-reaching and long-lasting, and it compounds the distrust that Aboriginal people have in the media. We currently, um, Newswalk um, was lent on. They weren't lent on, but they, they, they didn't take much to lean on, but they, um, the New South Wales government expressed a bit of dista distaste with a front page we read that said Aboriginal Australia had rejected Tony Abbott at the last election, which was very true. 
and that was the basis for why the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council got rid of Tracker magazine. And when they got rid of Tracker magazine, I mean, the emails that we got in from Aboriginal people all around the country who felt they finally had a voice, and we weren't always perfect because we were so under-resourced, but we were able to get to one-third of the Aboriginal population in New South Wales. And we often talk about remote Australia and the fact there aren't a lot of voices in remote Australia that get out there. I mean, we do have a really uh, extensive network of remote community broadcasters who are completely underappreciated and who unfortunately don't have access to mainstream media like the Australian. Um, but we also have a great deal of unmet need in places like New South Wales, which are never reported on. And that was part of the reason Tracker was in place as well. I mean, there are, there are deep infrastructure deficits on ex reserves and missions that have never been funded you know, not proper water and sewerage in, in Aboriginal communities. Aboriginal men, women and children are being locked up at increasing rates and things like the, the former O'Farrell government's decision to pass these sort of heightened fines and everything like that would only just compound the incarceration crisis. Um, the effect of mainstream policy on Aboriginal people is never looked into. Um, so I think I, I really believe that Aboriginal media have to be properly resourced to do their job. Um, I think there is a place for mainstream media, but there's also a really sore need for properly resourced independent media and investigative journalism to take up the case for Aboriginal Australia, so. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Um, okay, I, the, a, couple of, a couple of our speakers today have touched on this issue of news that is or is not coming out of remote Australia. Um, so, Jim, as I mentioned and as you've outlined, we've got a few networked news services in remote Australia. Um, but why is it that we're not seeing local news or are, is it occurring but we're, it's just not necessarily making it to those of us in the cities? What, what do you think is going on within the Indigenous media system uh, in terms of remote Australia? Well, it takes... Um, <coughs> excuse me, it takes a bit of time to compile a, a news service, as you know, and it's something that you have to do every day. It's not something, and, and if you're going to do it properly, it has to be probably updated a couple of times a day. Um, there's just, and I, and I don't like to call, you know, poor us or anything like that, but it's just, just the, um, the, the amount of time that it takes to do something like that, the amount of time it takes to train somebody to do something like that, uh, and what we've noticed over the years is particularly at, at, at uh, Karma, is that we'd get someone trained, they do their journalist uh, courses and things. Um, uh, we'd put all the time into that, and then they'd <coughs> the ABC would come along, or SBS, and they'd poach that person. They'd offer them 80 or $90,000 a year, base rate now, and it's only a couple of weeks ago that this happened at another place, uh, where uh, they just come and tried to poach the person and, and offered them $80,000. That person was just basically uh, out of a trainee situation to take them on a, and offer them a job. And I mean, there's no compensation back to the organisation that trained that person. So we could have put three or four years into that person, uh, all those people, to be poached by somebody else. Mm -hmm. I mean, it happens in, this, in the community sector in particular uh, all the time. And then we have to go to the begging bowl and always, again, put in for a, uh, a job placement a trainee position because we can't get the right wage to actually give that person. So that's one of the one of the reasons uh, why uh, we don't do as much news as what we should do. Um, we have a national funded uh, news service that it only operates five days a week, and uh, I mean you can't how, how do you operate a, you know five days a week and not on holidays? I mean you know that's a real welfare news sort of service, isn't it? You know, and uh, uh, Karma operate six days a week, so the seventh day there's just no news comes out of, out of there and on the Monday morning you'd get the Friday or Saturday's news that will be played, so you don't get the updated sporting results. Aboriginal people love to know the footy results, for example. So you don't get any of that sort of stuff. You may get it on TV if you're fortunate enough to have TV. Uh, you, and certainly, as what one of the speakers has said, they don't have some of the other nice uh, you know, pieces of equipment out in those remote areas and, and indeed towns and, and cities as well. Um, so there's, there's those few reasons, I think that's enough to say that while well, we don't have local sort of news services, but th there are a couple that do, do news services, uh, and, but they're mainly rip and read sort of things where they'll pick it up off AAP or if there's an Indigenous story floating around, or they'll 
they'll uh, leverage off one of the other uh, people like Courier Mail or something that may have put up a story uh, that they'd, they'd, they'd read. They wouldn't go out and actually put the time into research a, a new story. Mm. And that's possibly why they're starting to pick stuff up on Facebook and, and Twitter and that sort of thing. Yeah, so, so in terms of uh, news, and uh, this is really for all of the speakers, Kelly, Patricia and Amy as well, um, if you're trying to, if you're living in quite a small community or even a larger community, but where you have particular obligations um, to your networks and people, um, you know, is, is it difficult to put stories out there that other people might not want out there? And isn't that the role of journalism? Is this an inherent barrier within new media? Or, and particularly for Kelly, who's out, you know, you're doing this. Have you ever found that you've encountered resistance or you've said something that other people have disagreed with which has made you more reluctant to put it out there or? Well, when I started, I made sure that people knew that this is my truth and these are my stories. Mm -hmm. I don't write about other people's stories. I am not a journalist, I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. I write opinion pieces, that's about it. Uh, recently, Maury, as you may or may, or may not know, I'm about 12 children were taken from their homes very violently, very, very, very violently. We had police in right gear. All of those children have since been returned. Um, I was asked to write about it, but really didn't want to because I didn't want any repercussions from the family or from the community itself. Um, if one of the people from the, um, from the family had asked me, I would have done it without a doubt, mm. but not one of those people did. So mm. that's something that I did, but I'm not a journalist. Um, Patricia, mm. Amy? I think it actually demonstrated the heightened sense of accountability Aboriginal people, Aboriginal journalists have because you can't just go in and write, write lies. You've just you've uh, you've got to make sure you know the truth because obviously that affects you as well because it affects you and your community and your family. Mm -hmm. So I think that also demonstrates why there is a, a strong power in Aboriginal journalists and maybe sometimes you, you won't be able to do the story. But also, it's not the only way you can get a story up. I mean, Aboriginal journalists have a, have a strong network. Of, I mean, I'm not totally against the mainstream media. I think that's important. I just think sometimes the reporting isn't up to the standard. But there are other ways you can get a story out where you might not have to write it, but you can help other journalists mm do it. I mean, that, that shows that it's not so much driven by ego or anything. Sometimes you have to give the story away. And I think it just shows, like, obviously, Kelly can't just go in and write about the people because it'll affect her family. Mm. It'll affect her children, you know, if very she just goes so. out and writes that. Because mm. Maury's a very small community. And I had that in, in Rockhampton. I did an interview and I was just, you know, I was talking about a lot of issues that affected Rockhampton. And my dad was actually quite worried about how that would affect him because it's quite it's, I still consider it quite a lot of racism in Rocky and it had happened before where a young kid had given an interview from a, a, a community and he'd been actually racially abused um, within Rocky. So there are those, those things you have to think of because they affect you more so than a non-Indigenous journalist. Mm. It's a really interesting difference. And one of the things that strikes me in terms of um, the representation of Indigenous issues in the mainstream news is we have indigenous leaders, and I'm thinking here of say Noel Pearson or Bess Price or Pat Dodson, who um, will come out and, and, be, and, uh, and be well represented in the news on particular issues at certain times. And then we start hearing that um, they're not representative of all indigenous people, but it strikes me that this is the, the news system itself the mainstream news system itself requires leaders and it requires, it needs to identify spokespeople in order to be able to, um, I suppose, have a, an impact on the public generally. Is, is this an inherent problem and can new media overcome this? I mean, do, do, do you think that that is a problem with the mainstream media, Patricia, in terms of the I, the I know it's a perceived problem, so yeah. I, don't, I acknowledge that people have an issue with that. I'm, be blind if you didn't yeah. <laughs> acknowledge that people have an issue with it. Yeah. Um, I think people miss the nuance sometimes, though. Like, when I, I quote Noel Pearson a lot. I have a very good relationship with Noel Pearson. People are critical of him. I think he's a very um, strong, inspirational Aboriginal leader. Mm. But, you know, he, he's from... I, I make it clear he's, you know, from Cape York. Uh, he represents his own views. He doesn't ever claim... This is the thing. People put that on him. He's never claimed that he represents the whole views of Aboriginal Australia. I don't know where that came from because he... 
He wouldn't do that. Marcia Langton doesn't claim she represents the views, the homogenous view of Aboriginal Australia. Mm. Just like white people have a variety of politics, perspectives, so do Aboriginal people. So I find him quite dangerous, though, because the policies he actually, you know, he, he actually talks about, they end up affecting a great deal of Aboriginal Australia, like mm. his thinking affected the Northern Territory, for example. Yeah, I That's don't find him dangerous, really and I find that a lot of Aboriginal people, and I have gone to the remote communities, um, who, who knows if they'd be able to isolate that it came from him and what doctrine it is, but uh, income management, for instance, which I know you are not supportive of, but I think has had huge benefits for people. Uh, many remote women in Aboriginal communities were very supportive of income management. And many people were not supportive. Yeah, so not which one's right? Much. So the point yeah, is, yeah, it's a contested what area. You heard but to argue that Aboriginal people are not in favour of it is it. inaccurate. Yeah, but the overpowering... Um, the overpowering sentiment that you write about is that Aboriginal women are support in support of it, whereas a lot of people are not. And I think that that sort of that is that overpowers the opposition to its income management. I think anyway. Whereas it's funny um, you say that today. I have a story in the well. paper saying you know that people think income I think management is voluntary. a very bad thing. So yeah, there's lots That's of views. It. I think it should be voluntary. If a black woman wants to go on income management. It doesn't reflect the debate within Aboriginal communities, though, I don't think. I mean, you could report one story, then report another, but the overwhelming narrative is that the Australian newspaper is supportive of income management when a great deal of Aboriginal communities are not. And you don't hear that opposition given as much weight so as supporters of income management. And I, also I think that's evidence. a fair There's point. No it's for obvious it. that the Australian newspaper has a certain power in the Australian political sphere. Um, and that it does take a particular stand on certain issues. Um, I think there's been some fantastic journalism out of the, Austra the Australian as well. I, you know, I actually like a lot of what Nicholas Rothwell does. I think it's fantastic, even if I don't agree with him on everything. But, Amy, what, is there a capacity within the independent media, so the outlets that you've worked for, for competing with those views? Is it, it you know, how... Well, how we've do definitely you do that? tried. I think it is a question of resources, but particularly... Um, Tracker as well, like a main part of that was correcting the mainstream media's reporting of Aboriginal affairs. And an example of that is we led with a front page story about a Sydney Morning Herald story which completely demonised the community of Burke. And when you went out to Burke, it had far-reaching consequences for people out there because it totally misrepresented them, said they were the most violent town, when really there are a lot of really important issues that led to a lot of the social problems within Burke that completely... And it was on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald, so it really affected them. Mm. So a big part of that was actually correcting the mainstream media's reporting, and they never got an apology from the Sydney Morning Herald mm. either. So I think there is capacity for that. Obviously, it's very hard, but I think there are a lot of passionate Aboriginal journalists who are out to do that, um, but often they don't have the backing of, obviously, big media corporations so mm. obviously that's hard with travel and everything like that and don't have the reach that's the yeah. thing too yeah mm. Mm. okay uh, i'd like to open it up to the audience for some questions anyone want to weigh in on this debate or raise another question yes um i was a little bit um i don't think the comparison i'm not i'm not a journalist myself but i don't think the comparison between um like saying well noel pearson has his views and when we when we uh, promote his views or when we, we report on his views, I don't, you know, it's not like every white person shares the same views. The problem is that there are so many white people speaking, right? So if you only have a very limited pool of these uh, spokespersons, then people uh, may assume that, that it's far more wide reaching as a view than it actually is. Mm. Responses to that? I, yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. So. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes, there's another one out here. Hi. Uh, firstly, Luke Pearson, who you on the panel all know, but was the founder of Indigenous X and still manages it. He just puts in his apologies because he really wanted to come and raise a couple of questions himself, and he's at a board meeting today. Um, Amy, he was talking a lot about what you've raised today, last night, to me. And so I wanted to put a question. I would love for you to expand a bit more on what you were talking about and what the role of mainstream media is. He was talking a lot about what you all understand, I'm sure, very problematic issue of non-Indigenous people speaking about these issues, making decisions about who the spokespeople are and who the spokespeople aren't. And as a result, what, what the gentleman here has just said, that particular views are then seen by the non-Indigenous community as representative 
And uh, I, would, I would argue the mainstream media supports that by not getting those diversity of both sides of the argument of a lot of, a lot of the time or representing it in the way that Amy said. So Amy, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about how mainstream media can do it differently and how they can potentially stop being more and more and more non-Indigenous voices speaking on Indigenous issues. Okay, and perhaps, Jim, you'd like to respond to that as well, but Amy mm. first. You all, um, you no, go you first? go first. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, they own the newspapers, you see. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a big thing, is that um, uh, we've probably got a, a couple of small magazines around the place, you know, uh, Torres News is now owned uh, by, by a consortium of people as well. Um, but, and that's, that's one of the main issues, is that it, 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 these people have the ear of government. And, and that's, that's one of the main, main problems. So if they want to know something, they'll just go to the easiest person or they'll go to their media person. They've all got media persons to go to. You can't just pick the phone up. I mean, you pick the phone up and ring Jim Media really easily, you know, K and D. But I mean, you can't pick the phone up and ring up Noel or anybody else as, as easy as that. You've got to make some kind of appointment and then they'd want to know a list of questions. And they'd, you know, so they'd run you through all of that sort of thing. But um, I, I guess if you listen to what I said earlier on today about having a roadmap for our own Indigenous media, well, well we did. We had a roadmap that was going to be something like um, uh, other parts of the world have. And um, uh, it, it would have had something like its own uh, uh, autonomy or, or its own authority. And then we maybe we could have started to get some real debate into the reconciliation stuff and, and into the uh, referendum stuff and, and some real debate from, from community people to actually uh, you know, go into that and not be shouted down. So the moment you say anything in this country, if you're uh, not one of the people to go to, you, you imagine, you, you, you get a big bucket tipped on you straight away. It's like um, there'll be a count of you, you know, whether it's blogged or whether it's uh, uh, um, in the newspaper. I I'm a blogger as well, you know. I mean, I blog under, under a name, Tell Me Unk, and I've got my name up there. And um, I've had a lot of criticism from uh, that side of the, the fence as well for some of the blogs that I've written. And um, so you've got to be prepared that if you're going to be writing stuff, that you're going to get criticism. And you're going to get criticism from some of the from the big end of town, um, but we don't have our own independent media, as such. Uh, uh, certainly don't have it at NITV. I mean, they might they might say to you, "Well, we're indigenous controlled," but they're not because the guys sitting up the back are the white guys in the suits. So, and I feel that that's the same as any any of the other newspapers as well. If you're an indigenous writer on them. There's somebody else that's sitting up the back saying to you, look, I'd rather have Noel's view on this. I don't want that view because that's a bit too radical and that's sort of... I don't think Australians can really deal with that, you know? But that's the sort of view that's... Uh, that's, that's that sort of situation. I think sometimes really legitimate Aboriginal voices and opinions are seen as radical when they're actually not and they're shared by a lot of people in the Aboriginal community. Like, I never see Michael Mansell and Gary Foley quoted extensively when an important policy announcement happens. And I think we're in a stage now where we've completely... I mean, I see it as a really critical time in Aboriginal policy making because we're going completely the opposite direction of where I think a lot of blackfellas really want to go, and that's towards a more assimilationist, paternalistic agenda, particularly under the Abbott government. And when you oppose that, you're seen as radical or a fringe view or something like that. And I feel a lot of Aboriginal people maybe are less confident to speak out in the media. And also we just see the leaders who are espousing those views aren't given those, those same voices, which is why I think it's important to have an independent Aboriginal media that has a different role to play than mainstream media. Um, and it's just the, I mean, the, import, the level of importance that um, some Aboriginal leaders who continually get a chance to have their say have over over the media people like Noel Pearson and Marcia Langton and then when a, a opposing view comes out and criticizes them they're they're sort of back down again and I think we saw that in the way Noel recent debates over Noel Pearson and his bully boy ways and everything like that. Yeah. <coughs> I don't want to Sorry, make you I, Amy, I don't want to have an argument with you, but I think yeah. that defaming um, Noel Pearson on a public panel is probably not... I wasn't not defaming you, I was saying well, about the current debate, which... No, I said... I probably should have said alleged bully boy ways, but that was what was raised um, within the media, which is what I was alleged. referring to. Sorry? Those issues about this were raised in the mainstream media. 
Yeah, it was raised by Paul Sheehan. So. Okay, so it was a quote. Yeah. Which is what, when you criticise... Nigel Scullion, who yeah. went on the record in my newspaper the day after yeah. New Matilda... Hang on, can we get the microphone if, if you're going to respond? We need who went on the record the day after my newspaper that so New Matilda... Wait, wait a second, can we let Patricia okay. speak I'll, first? Yeah. I don't have to speak if you don't want me to. Would you no, like I mean, even like that I'd criticism like about Noel Pearson... Hang on a second, can we, have, can we just involved? have Patricia respond because it'd be good the to hear... The Minister for Indigenous no. Affairs went on the record in my newspaper, please, yep. happy to send it to anyone who wants my email address, to openly concede that he approached Noel Pearson Aboriginal and began Aboriginal men the are argument. vilified all the time, and would you stand up for Aborig other Aboriginal men who yes, are vilified around anyone who's around vilified, country, I generally but with stand the same, up But with the same level that you are standing up for Noel Pearson. I'm That's just suggesting, Patricia, that, that Amy was not defaming. She was referring to a okay, mainstream media. But I, I, I so think... The yeah. general assertion that Noel Pearson is a bully is something that is defamatory and I would contest. Okay, so let's move on from Noel Pearson. Do we have any other questions out here? Yep. Oh, hi. Um, Amy and Jim both mentioned our own Aboriginal controlled media organisational sort of larger scale thing. Jim referred to a roadmap towards that in the past that didn't come to eventuality. But I'm just wondering from both of you what you think that might look like now, if there was a, a possibility for that to happen, um, how would, you know, what kind of resourcing it would need, where you thought that would come from mm. and how it would be able to be independent? Well, you wouldn't have, um, you'd have your own spectrum for a start. You wouldn't have the ABC and SBS gobbling up all the, all the broadcast spectrum across the country. As soon as a bit of spectrum comes up, the ABC have got it, or, or SBS have got it, uh, at the expense of the Indigenous uh, uh, spectrum. The, the situation in Victoria is that there's very little spectrum. There's no FM spectrum in Melbourne. There's uh, very little in, in, in country Victoria because it's all been gobbled up by, the, by all the ensemble of ABC and SBS. Now, it's going to be very, very difficult for Indigenous people to get radio spectrum. Uh, digital spectrum may be okay for television in the future because that hasn't been allocated, but in terms of the radio FM stuff, it's out of the question in places like Ballarat, Bendigo, where there's large populations of Indigenous people. So had we had this roadmap had it been followed back in uh, 2000, that spectrum wasn't allocated and the full saddle for Telstra, uh, for the analogue, had just begun. So we would have had spectrum right across the country where we could have had things like television service, radio services in those places. But now we've got to go back and, and, and fight for those and try and get those and a lot of the places we're not going to get. We wouldn't have had NITV sitting there now uh, uh, on, on SBS with SBS control. Now, I don't care what you say about NITV. Okay, so they do some, some shows that are okay. If you like, if you like Maori wrestling or Maori hunting, or all of those sorts of things, you know, uh, or, or some basketball or something, we'll go across there and watch it. But it's certainly not uh, what it would have been like if it had been under community control uh, um, television. We would have had more of the stuff that you get getting out of remote Australia on there. You would have had more uh, culturally developed sort of material. Uh, you would have had a lot more documentaries. You would have had a lot more of that stuff. You, uh, I know people like the, the, the football, but, I mean, how many more replays can you have, uh, for example, you know? So it would have been different from that point of view that we would have had tangible radio services across the country. We would have had uh, a good television service across the country. And so that's what the roadmap would have, would have looked like. Yeah. Um, I mean, news isn't just about the kind of controversial issues and spokespeople that we've been talking about today. News can also just be about getting information to the people that need it. So bringing it back to that level, one thing I've noticed in terms of particularly the remote media sector, that with uh, funding withdrawn from remote video production since 2007, uh, with a tiny exception that comes through the Community Broadcasting Foundation, um, we're seeing a lot, of, a lot of the content that's being produced about remote Australia is, is essentially um, what I would call social marketing media. 
So it's coming out of um, either community cultural development organisations or, say, um, you know, charities and health, or health agencies, a lot of it government funded. What, does, what, what is that doing? I mean, what is that for? And, and is, that, is that enough? Or, I mean, particularly in terms of health, Kelly, I'm kind of interested, how do we make sure that health and health issues are reaching people in the way that they're most likely to take on that information that they need? Just read my blog. Read your blog, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, okay. I mean, you know, you get a lot of... I know what you're talking about, you know, yeah. social media marketing. Yeah. These are people that are paid to say this shit. So, you know, yeah, I'm not getting paid to pay anything that that isn't true. And I do, you know, use a lot of health services. As I said earlier, you know, I live with mental health. Um, I have other health issues, and, you know, and every health service there is, I've used it. So when I write about it or blog about it for Crokey, then it's true. It's all true. And Is it journalism when, when a lot of the media that we're seeing is, is essentially just government-funded information being distributed by No, it's advertisement. Companies. It's advertising? Okay. Yeah. Yep. It's like the recognised. Look, like Amy was talking about it before. Yep. It's a constitutional recognised. It's advertising. And yep. like Amy, I don't know any black person, and I live in Maury. We got a lot of black people there. Nobody wants it. Okay. Not one person else. What do they want? They want sovereignty. But do you think that in a if there was a you know national vote, you'd get that, or wouldn't it, it just sink? Well, they want sovereignty in a way that they want dedicated seats in Parliament or Senate. They want to have control over the conversation. And they want, I think right. Noel Pearson actually has they want raised dedicated seats in Parliament. Well, that's something where I do agree with Noel Pearson, mm. actually. Yeah. So, Amy, you just said they want control over the conversation. Yeah, uh, I think I, these are debates. I mean, even treaty is quite controversial within Aboriginal communities because what would it look like? Mm. Would it even deliver anything? But they want it, oh, from my experience... Um, Blackfellas want to talk about that first rather than constitutional reform, which is very much seen as a white dream. Yeah. So it's about yeah. giving voice to those other debates that are being taken off the political agenda. And, I mean, the reason constitutional reform is on the political agenda is because John Howard used it in an election mm. year mm. to push for that. So it's very much removed from Aboriginal opinion. Yeah. Okay. Think. And any final comments from the other panellists today? Oh, well, it's quite, it's the, the issue around the... Um, you know, around an Indigenous uh, media authority is a big issue. I mm -hmm. mean, and, and it'll answer a lot of these sorts of questions. And um, um, But I don't think we're ever going to get it. I mean, mm. uh, I mean, you know, like a very high-level bureaucrat said to me when we were going through a whole range of these reports about the National Indigenous Broadcasting, a NIBS report that was done by the Productivity Commission, people may know about that, which said that we should have this, this, this authority. A high-level bureaucrat at the secretarial level said quietly, it'll never happen. Mm. And I mean, um, and, and, it, and it didn't happen. And, and it doesn't look like happening for, you know, ever. I mean, it's a bit like where, uh, like, you know, what is it, a, a treaty? Or is it native title? Like, native title is not land rights. Yeah. I mean, yeah, everybody knows that, but everybody's, sucked into this whole this whole debate now all this stuff about Noel and, and everybody else those 10 people it, this there's a lot of history here it goes way back this uh, this like for these people yeah that's goes true. way way yeah. way back to the sellout of the wick yeah and it goes back further than that to earlier sellouts and uh, and people just don't like that you know I mean we, we just go away and we like I said uh, and we try something new. Mm -hmm. And like in media, we're trying something new. We're, we're trying new platforms. Yeah. You know, we're trying to get sub-networks. We're trying to get other small networks together so that we can continue to have that, uh, uh, that identity, that voice, so that when you listen to k and you can hear a black fella talking on there. Mm. And you know, you can identify with that and they can, they can hear that and identify straight away with that. He might not speak the Queen's English in that sort of term, but he knows that he's going to say cuz and bruz and, you know, and, and that sort of stuff. And a lot of people that may be low level, but to, to us, 
It's it's really you know, okay. it's really something. It makes you it makes people feel you know proud. And I think that is a fantastic note to end on, recognising the innovation and importance of uh, Indigenous media and what's going on today. So please join me in thanking all of our panellists today.